Hello and welcome to Susie's book bag. I haven't got a designated book bag for this particular publisher. They're called Indigo Press, but I have got an Indigo book bag and indeed an Indigo dyed jacket. I also think that the Blue Lady gives a kind of feeling of a museum. That's where we're going for the next conversation. Um, with a wonderful author, Suzanne Joynson. We're going to be talking about her book, The Museum of Lost and Fragile Things. I shall invite Suzanne into the book bag right now. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> so, um, as I've said, we're going to be chatting about your book. It's a memoir. It's subtitled A Year of Salvage. You've written two novels, Changing to memoir is always a very interesting thing. But I wanted to start actually by talking about names because um, we're both Susie's. Yeah. And I think, and from reading this book, there's something crucial about renaming yourself as a Susie or it's as true. something else. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I remember distinctly doing it. I think I was at sixth form. And mm. I just suddenly went, yeah, no, call me Susie. And I think mm. my family had all called me Sue. Mm. And um, Suzanne felt something otherly. And I was named after Leonard Cohen's Suzanne, and I, I, the, the song Suzanne, and I, and I hated that. So I wanted <laughs> to away from that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, and it's funny. Um, uh, there are a lot of Susies in my life. My editor's Susie. So, yeah, I know what mm. you mean. It's a, it's a thing, isn't it, to change a name like that? It is, a, it is a thing. It's some kind of statement that, look, I am me and I'm going to decide who that me is. Yeah. Um, I made my peace with Leonard Cohen, Suzanne, a long time ago, and I quite <laughs> like it. I mean, if you're a, a Suzanne, a Susan, as I am, um, there aren't many songs. <laughs> to be honest, I like it. I like it now. And actually, I like the yeah. lyrics as well. Um, yeah. But I, I, I kind of went in and out with it, you know. Yeah. Um, and then once I did find myself in China on a train with a bag of oranges, which is one of the lyrics, so it's oh, Suzanne yeah. on the train in China, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. oh, I'm living the Leonard Cohen song. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. the other thing is that people decide um, themselves to call you Sue, I find. Um, and I've got a short name anyway. I don't want it to be even shorter. So, um, yeah. yeah, Susie was the way forward. Um, so let's get on to your, your book. Um <laughs> You mention in it that you're an obsessive writer. This is something that started quite young. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, how that manifested itself, because yeah. it obviously really helped you at certain times. Yeah, I think so. So in this um, book, I talk about, um, so, so my parents were part of a thing called the divine light mission mm -hmm. and it was very much of its time very late 70s early 80s sort of tail end of the kind of hippie you might say pseudo eastern using that sort of mm -hmm. gen generic term feel um although it changed later and one of the main um sort of central ethos is, is was um to not have stuff and get rid of stuff mm -hmm. and so material possessions and things like that were kind of frowned on but pencils and pens and the stuff of writing was always a, what they're one of those things that was all around so whereas bigger things in my life would be would go um they were tools that I could kind of control like all kids mm -hmm. you know crayons mm -hmm. drawing and uh, things were kind of complicated as obviously I write about and um, I had this habit of writing on the wall next to my bed um, I still find it quite hard not to do that actually but I, <laughs> I do it in hotels <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or random places or loo walls you know I find the the process of the thinking in the head and the flowing of the ink through the pen into down onto whatever it is where you're making a mark for me from a very early age was like a really profound thing i could control my own thoughts i could make some kind of uh, sense of something and whether it, it didn't really matter whether it's ink it doesn't really matter whether it's drawing or writing did in fact mm. those two things really cross over um it's something to do with that flow through you know mm. 
brain out through the pen into the page and, and I find it incredibly peaceful I don't know what it does there must be like neuroscience around it but mm. it must be like knitting I think maybe some people or weave it I don't know but for me it kind of cools something down in the synapses of my brain mm. and is makes it, me controlled sorry, sorry is it a sort of um is it a kind of unconscious process sort of an automatic rather process or are you as a writer now crafting those thoughts how does it work yeah I think so I think as in the past it was a bit more um, manic and wild mm -hmm. and at moments like sort of very compulsive and then you know to to be bothered to write novels and memoirs and things you have to have a certain amount of there's got to be something driving that impetus isn't it and and, and some and and it varies in everybody and for me it was it has been a certain kind of controlling of elements like that and um so now it's it's con contained i know when i'm um just blethering and i know when it's real i can i also understand things like it's okay to write stuff that's a bit rubbish for a period of time and then push into something more curated and controlled as well right. yeah. it's the story of of growing up in this sort of odd household <laughs> very hippie household in a way and i wondered uh, when were you very young when you thought hang on other people don't live like this <laughs> Yeah, because quite it's, often people just think, well, everybody's like this, surely. That's right. Yeah. Like this is normal. This is everyone's normal. Yeah. Yeah. I was it's such. A, so I grew up in Crewe in in Cheshire in a in a kind of classic northern post-industrial council estate so you had the, and i know i don't sound like i come from that anymore but i've uh i spent many years in a kind of um spiral about class and identity kind of mm -hmm. so my my accent goes all over the place mm -hmm. but so it was very much crew eight years council estate and um and uh, <clears throat> and so there was but in my in our house my parents were um really straining against this environment so they had um come from families that were very working class nobody had been to university a lot of issues to do with um poverty and money and alcohol and things like that that you would find um and so they could see no route other than the typical thing that you would do if you finish school quite early in one of those towns at that time in the 70s, which was go, go and work in one of the big factories. So for my dad, it was Rolls Royce, and for my mum, it was a sewing factory. And she, they didn't want to do it. And why would they? You know, it's a kind of misery feeling to to that for them, really young, looking down down the barrel of doing that for a long time. And so when they encountered this kind of counterculture scene that was around at that time, very proactive, that it offered them a completely alternative um, view of the world. And it's hard now in this kind of cynical contemporary time, you know, where meditation and yoga and all that stuff is completely mainstream now. But back in mm -hmm. the day, it was really, really fringe, especially mm -hmm in that part of the country mm. um, and also in that class group as well, you know. And um, and so they entered this world, which was exciting. Um, you know, you meditate, you reach something other and the divine light mission, as it was called at that time, um, promised that you would gain, if you did a certain amount of meditation and a certain amount of um, giving up of things and stuff and you dedicated a, various things you would eventually reach this thing called knowledge which they always had as a capital k mm -hmm. and so what i had was a family who were trying and straining and looking for alternatives to what was around and then and then i would be at school you know looking really weird with the strange like <laughs> home <homeless> stuff and <laughs> and i knew immediately I mean, I think m my brother and I knew, you, uh, you're talking five or seven, very early. It was like, everybody else at school and on this estate are not doing this. <laughs> and we knew we were very different, yeah. 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 Uh, there's a, a slightly weird thing coming out through the book where, I mean, this guy Bill turns up. I don't know whether um, you've changed the name, but... Um, I have, so yeah. 
So, right, okay, so Bill uh, turns up and, and, you know, kind of almost takes over. And one of the creepy things about all of this, which sounds very nice so far, yeah. you know, don't be materialistic, meditate. Yeah. Um, there's a really strange thing about dividing parents from children. Yeah. And sort of saying, yeah, leave, leave the kids. The, the kids, was there a sense that the kids were a hindrance to so your growth? One of, yeah, so one of the very strong tenets of the Divine Light Mission, which would now be called a cult or an organised group, but obviously at that time didn't la label itself mm. as that, um, was, you know, there is even a quote from from the, the leader of it who was called, everyone referred to as Maraji then, later Premarat, um, you know, to, something like put put the children aside, meditation is more important. And just prior mm -hmm. to when my parents got involved, so a little bit earlier in the 70s, there were experimental houses, they would probably call them ashrams, and but they weren't, they weren't really, but, um, and they would, uh, they were experimenting with the, put all the children over there so that the parents can do this. And I think um, there are um, tes testimonials and accounts of people in this, just the generation before me who have experienced that. And that sense of, so the, the Bill person that you're talking about, I have changed the name, but he, he was a real person. Mm -hmm. what we can feel the, what we would now see as kind of grooming or kind of influence mm -hmm. happening. You know, my parents went to Manchester um, and that's where the scene was at the time. And they met people and they were very, very proactive. Come to this group, come and talk to us. And, you know, at one point they spoke to Scientology um, people, but I don't think my parents had enough money for them. <laughs> so they were slightly rejected. <laughs> so I could have had a whole other route, but um, so, um, so the, the, there was a kind of, t it was a time of preying on people, or people who might be vulnerable, um, people who are looking for something else. And then this, the, there was a, I mean, this still goes on today in different, as we know, in, in different modes. And my parents in, the, in that exact time and place were very susceptible to that. And also, you know, I do have, you know, I've talked through with my family a lot about this, but you know, the bill person he was from a he was from a very middle class family um upper middle class actually and there's a in in the counterculture of that time you would have a lot of the kind of people who went to oxford and then they go on the hippie trail and they end up with a great big house and it's all marvelous and then and then they would be that some of those would be drawing in participants and people getting involved who are not necessarily from that background and you're talking about the sort of vulnerabilities of people are very very different in that scenario um, and there was a lot of that going on so it was a bit like come to our great big house out in the suburbs and you can learn to meditate and then things are different people have people go to India here people are looking for uh, their aspirations are wider and so there was this kind of strange stepping stone feeling that crossed over into that, oh, but that completely contradicted with the affluence is meaningless and mm -hmm. and um, who needs stuff when you can give everything to Maraji. So you can see how it's very, very contradictory. Mm -hmm. And then you have to remember that it's all pre-internet. So it wasn't a time of you can Google and find things out in two seconds. It was very, very different. So I remember our house, it was cassettes, it was pamphlets, it was those kind of analog materials. And it's, and, and the networks and the systems were very high, you know, you would, you, they would go to events, they would meet people and networking people's houses. Um, and so it would bring a sociable side to it as well. It would feel nice. Like you say, come in, drink this tea, have this, da, 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 da. But actually, the messages underlining were really quite complicated. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And as a kid, for me, the trickiest thing that I found was being told that there was a secret. We know a secret, and the secret is profound. And you're not allowed to know it because you're a kid. And that I I, I don't blame my parents for doing that because they were in, they were really young. My they had me when they were nineteen. Mm. So. 
uh, writing the book is kind of un trying to understand rather than judge or blame is, is the idea. But to be told when you're a kid that all these adults who are sitting doing this kind of meditation, whatever it is they're doing, they used to call it satsang, and they have some sort of secret information. And then you're sitting in your bedroom like, what? You know, and you're, it's really hard to get your head around, you know? Mm. And it's like, what is it that you're supposed to do? We understand these techniques now in terms of cults mm -hmm. and things. It's classic. Mm. You know, if you if you come and attend these five mm. seminars, you'll be given some special whatever. And we understand it. We can see it from a very cynical point of view now. Mm. But, you know, pre-internet, pre-access to that sort of information, it's a different story. Mm. The, the impression that you give in the book, I mean, a lot of the book is about a very sort of difficult relationship with your mum, but turning to your father just briefly, I mean, he, he does come across as a very genuine spiritual seeker. Yeah, I think... I'm not that... saying that your mum wasn't, but he he seems a, a different level in a way. Yeah, I think that is true. I think that's very true. There's a genuine kind of need for some sort of um system spiritual system for him yeah and he still meditates and etc and that sort of thing so yeah i think that's very insightful of you to have picked up on that i would say that's true yeah mm. and um how do you think as a child i mean i mean children are material materialistic in a sense their their toys and the things around them <laughs> yeah. are tremendously yeah. important yeah um and I mean, this stuff about, well, you know, let's get rid of your teddies or whatever. Um, yeah. How how did that affect you? I mean, both then and kind of now, do you find yourself clinging to things in case yeah. someone takes them yeah. away from you? Yeah, well, you can see I'm not a minimalist in any way. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this screen hides many, yeah. <laughs> many heaps of things. Many, many sins. <laughs> so I, obviously when you're a kid, you're just being a kid. And, uh, mm. and I, I was writing and I was feeling uncomfortable. I found the atmosphere of Divine Light Mission stuff uncomfortable and creepy. And I knew that, but maybe I didn't have words for it. Mm. um but it was invasive and 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 strange and different from everything outside the stuff w is linked to a range of things so there would be the kind of let's get rid let's clear things out let's get rid of stuff there's that going on the, but there's also a kind of question around home and and sanctity and 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 being anchored and I remember when I first went into, I first moved to, to the South and I went into a big um, uh, home, which was the opposite of all the homes I had. And it had um, polished wooden floors and a piano. And what we were walking around houses, and even now I still do it, walking around houses where there are pictures, there are photo albums, there are curated areas designated to the shrine of the family. You know, it's so amazing. I find these things so amazing and beautiful. You know, things are arranged and placed and they mean something. You know, they might have been, and, and it's things that have been carried down. And um, so what we didn't have and what we don't really have is any of that. So the, the, the sense of, um, it's not so much really even to do with the things, it's the, it's the placing of them and the having somewhere to hold them. Mm -hmm. um, which is not to say that individually my family don't have things that are precious, it's just that, you know, as I tell the story in the book, you know, if you, if you live in a council house and then your family split up, then you're suddenly not in a council house. Everybody's thrown out into the, into the world of private renting with not the money to actually afford private renting and 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 then you're just in this scrabbling sense of what what do i do i put my stuff in boxes where do they go if you're moving around constantly you just don't have these kind of archival spaces and everything gets lost i had i managed to cling on to a pile of vinyl my dad sold his vinyl but then i managed to cling on to a few little bits and then over the years they got lost and uh, you know and things like that 
and then I n now have a very complicated relationship with stuff. So, for example, I obsessively collect certain things and I go to car boot sales and I go love mm. charity shops and I get things. But I also lose everything. And I, uh, I, um, apart from my wedding, I've really lost every piece of jewellery I've ever had. And I don't know how to... I'm always in awe of people who hold on to them. <laughs> Hold on, just know how to manage and control stuff. I just don't have, I don't have it disappears, can't find it. I'm getting slightly better as I've got, <laughs> reached the joyous middle age slightly. But yeah, so my, so it would be a kind of obsessive need to collect certain things, but then an inability to hold on to them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so funny when we think that now there's a lot of talk, isn't it, about mindfulness and also clear your clutter. Mm. Um, and I think these things are a lot deeper than than they're often presented as, you yeah. know, like yeah. if you're holding on to things or even not holding on to things, yeah. there's probably yeah. a reason why it's, it's worth huge, isn't it? digging. Yeah. And memoir is a form of digging. So um, when you mentioned your, your brother, um, do you sort of get, get permission to write or do you sort of say well look you can look at it and if there's anything yeah. you really hate I'll take it out well you know I really didn't want to write this but I did not want to write it as memoir I didn't want to do it I was I, I much prefer fiction in the safer realms of, mm. of that not that not that it's safe but you know what I mean mm -hmm. and um so I started to write this book almost in novel form and it just wasn't real life was barging in and I knew that it wasn't, I wasn't doing what I needed to do. And eventually I confronted the fact that I needed to tell this story as the point of creating this story, this shaping this narrative is mm. that it's real. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and then I tried to sort of auto fiction in between it, but it didn't feel, it felt fake and strange. I thought, okay, I'm going to have to do it. So I, first of all, I decided to do it as if no one will see it. So I wrote one whole version as a kind of private exercise to see what where I was going and then once I was deep into that I got like that spidery feeling of oh I don't think this is the worst book that's ever been written in the history of time <laughs> maybe <laughs> and so I showed it to like one person and then she said I think this is really special and it feels powerful so I said okay so I um, finished it and then I told my mum, dad and brother the main, the three main, you know, people in it and I, so I printed it out and I sent it to each of them and I wrote a letter and I said look, my version of events is not going to be your version and I'm not really trying to, for it to be your version and then this is going to be very strange for you to read. You've probably, they probably, of course they'd all guessed I was, I was probably, you know, it's no, it was no surprise to them. Um, you you need to tell me what you don't have to kind of we don't have to do some great group family therapy or anything like that but you you need to say first of all if you don't want me to publish it you need to say at this point secondly if there's anything if you do if you're okay with me and I, I, at this point I didn't know if it's going to get published it was the stage before secondly is there anything you want to take out so they all read it it was you know it's no one's idea of fun to have a memoir a daughter's writer <laughs> no mm. one's idea but they were absolutely amazing and they kind of understood my my reasons for doing it and so they all agreed to it my dad took a little bit out but not very much my mom agreed to it which was really amazing of her because it's a complicated story mm -hmm, related mm -hmm. to her she said i understand why you need to write it and yes it's okay to publish it how sh how further she feels about it I don't know but and um, my brother as well was really nice about it so they've been incredible and um and uh, and then I had to do like a legal thing as well so mm -hmm. when it do, does go through to the publisher um you have a kind of legal read and then you look and uh, you know privacy and personal stuff is very difficult because to be in a position where you're telling your story is a bit is a point of privilege and I understand that and I think that what I hope is that through the telling of reading of the story even though it's my point of view and not the other family members um is that you, it is clear that I'm not 
I'm trying to come from a place of understanding. Mm -hmm. I might not achieve it completely, but that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm hoping that that comes through. I think if I tried to write it 10 years before, it wouldn't have been like that. It'd been like, run, 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 you know, different. Yeah. yeah. So I had to get to this age to be able to have a bit of ability to, mm -hmm. yeah, step back. And what about the the structure? Because it sort of weaves time together. Um, mm -hmm. Did you find that that happened quite naturally when you were writing? Um, you know, sort well, of dual perspective. In a yeah. Way. It, I, it, what I didn't want was, you know, it's like reading someone's dreams or I didn't want to force somebody to go through blah, 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 blah. And <laughs> also in the writing of it, I did come to understand um, what I had only, I only really, I knew it in the theory, but I only got it through writing was that when you write memoir, it's really about the present anyway. Everything, mm -hmm. even though you're thinking about things that have happened, it's all about where you are now. And it took me quite a long time to, to figure out a structure where, uh, where going back in time was anchored in a kind of time, a, 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 um, a sense of time that made sense. So, and then the process of kind of really going deep into it did happen over this year. So to place it in a year and follow that through mm -hmm. was the kind of structure that I, the, the kind of linear structure, chronological mm -hmm. structure in a sense. Um, the, what I was trying to do was get a sense of how when you're in the present and you're living your life, the past will come in, whether whether you want it to or not, and then it will come out again. And mm -hmm. I, I did try really hard to capture that in and out without mm -hmm. losing the reader, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted it to be a story that works as a story, but also mm -hmm. gets this kind of almost looping of memory through. Yeah, I think it. I think it's really ages. well. Yeah, uh, um, but I was always interested to see whether you know, in when you were editing it, you were kind of moving things around or thinking, there's something missing here. I need to sort of add something. That this. Yeah, point. yeah. The tricky thing I found was, so, it, you know, you've got this thing about truth and accuracy, and then you've got this thing about a good story and mm. and how you know how do you manage that and then truth and accuracy are massive words that are really complicated anyway aren't they and and so what i had to do was in terms of telling a story that was real and or, or, i hate the word authentic it's too massive but you know what i mean mm. coming from good faith whatever um i had to kind of figure out my own private um parameters because nobody really knows whether it was way raining well, probably could you could actually check out the trap the, the weather on a particular day, but you know, was my were, were, you know, did we have eggs for breakfast on that morning in 1983? Does it matter? Does it not matter? Yes, it kind of does. It does matter, but it, were they exactly scrambled or fried? Maybe not. So you see, I I get very suspicious of all those. You know, it's kind of I was bouncing on my space yeah. hopper and mum was cooking the Finder yeah. <laughs> like... when the theme tune of such and such, you yeah. know. Yeah, it's, you I can't remember that. Made. You cannot remember that. No. So, what, so what you've got, but then an, another time you'll get a really hallucinatory memory, which is really vivid. And then you'll have other bits that you're like, mm. and so. Mm. I was thinking about, um, I looked at various different memoirs and memoirists and stuff, and you've got like, you, you know, like Mary Carr and Edmund White and those mm. from that generation of memoirists, brilliant, mm. amazing books, absolutely brilliant. But a kind of, I think, unreal expectation about accuracy and truth. So, you know, mm. I've checked this with every single member of the family and I've done every human possible thing that you can do and da 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 and I insist that this is real and this happened. And then you've got someone like Yi Yun Lee and she's talking about writing a memoir and she's like, those perfectly arranged narratives are not true mm. and that cannot be true. And so what does it mean? And then she does a whole anti, you mm. know, sort of anti memoir. So I had to figure my way through. So the only way I could do it was a really unscientific way, which was sort of like, does it feel emotionally like this was 
real. And so, and, and, I, and there were points where I really didn't want to take a bit out because I really liked the writing. I was like, oh, I've written this fabulous whole thing. But I knew deep down that I'd <laughs> pushed too far in a certain direction. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. and then I had to force myself to bring that back out so that what was left was as emotionally real and accurate as I could mm. make it. And then um, kind of, I don't know, be open. The, the other issue is when you're dealing with things like complicated family mental health stuff and behaviours, mm. the, 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 the way that those things manifest is repetitively. So it will be the same thing over and over and over again, over decades. And mm. of course, that's nobody wants to read that because the whole point of it is that's quite difficult, but also nobody wants to read that. You can't mm. say, and then and that happened that year and later that year. And, and so what I also had to do is mm. it kind of find a one version that of something that happened and tell that as a kind of example of all, all the times that would have happened do you see what i mean mm -hmm. so yeah yeah well it's it's like a mosaic where you would have two colors and they're the same color but they're not in the it's part of yeah. a pattern so i yeah. think what you do um certainly with sort of various conversations with your mum is that you you have these examples of the sort of things that she would say and we get the impression from the book that this is a pattern so yeah. you don't need to sort of say this happens all the time you just sort of think this is a worldview yeah that is expressing itself in a way um i mean you've you've got children haven't you yeah i yeah. i wondered whether um because uh, I think of this with my own family in a way, if you see a child growing up at a certain age and then and if they're the same gender as you, that helps. Yeah. You, it sort of brings you back age four, age five, age six. Yeah. In the sense that you, you would sort of think, gosh, I hate it if that happened to this little six year old. Yeah. Yeah. It's did did it sort of stir things up for you? Yeah, it, yeah, wow. of course. Yeah, definitely. So it was, you know, I kind of like everyone went off living 20s, 30s and the impact of of those early years and that early part of my life um was with me in everything I was doing, but I it really, I didn't start to reflect on it until I had kids on my own, exactly that. And it was like, God, how, you know, all of these, this atmosphere, this feeling, this difficult world was there. And I was five and mm. at six or n and eight and trying to figure it out. And my brother as well. Um, and actually my parents were teen, you know, they were so young, 21, 24, 25, no money. And so, it did all crack open when I had kids in the sense of, whoa, and I, and I, but I didn't have any capacity to know how to handle it really. And I really, I really didn't even confront the fact that we were part of this divine light mission. We really, we moved, we moved, we sort of moved on with our lives and it was in the distance, in the periphery. And then also a part of, some sort of kind of brainwashy stuff that we'd had as a kid mm. and you could say but I both but I kind of really suppressed it and then really only I remember like I guess I was at um uni when emails were just coming in so I'm that like crossover generation of and just getting phones so mm. when the internet came in bam you can imagine so all sorts of people who've been involved were googling and discovered it mm. Margie has four private jets and a massive mansion and blah, 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 and everything falls apart in many ways. Um, and although people still want to believe in lots of things, don't they? And I remember around that time saying to my mum and dad, you do realise that all that stuff, you know, have you Googled it? Have you looked? There's whole forums and there's all sorts of stuff. It's very painful, you know, mm -hmm. my, you know, to, to confront that, it feels embarrassing, it feels weird, you know, these words like cult are really heavy. And, you know, even, it really even took up to writing this book to fully embrace what it means to have had coercive control influences in 
in your life at such a young age and then to kind of deal with the ramifications of it through time mm. and it's and, and my narrative is not so much oh there was a big girl and i hated him and now i want to be emancipated from him it's more because he didn't have that effect on me it was it's more the kind of insidious atmosphere and how that played out through time you know it's kind of almost sort of big marshmallowy thing that was very difficult to pin down for a long time in in writing the book you you had to sort of go back into that world um in a certain sense i mean you had to listen to tapes and you've got transcriptions of some really quite banal sayings it has yeah. to be it has to be said um I mean, what what kind of supported you as you did that? I mean, I I can imagine it would be like jumping off a cliff, really. Just like I'm I'm going to look hard at this world again that I yeah. have done so much to escape from. Yeah, it was tricky, and also like you say, they are, but not you. You know, everything is such a raging cliche now. You know, oh. Um, oh i don't know what was the one your your soul will be sent to blood you know you can't hear any of these fra you can't believe anyone can believe any of this stuff and you mm, can't mm. believe that any of this will have any power but so one of the difficult things was like oh god that did have that power at that time mm. and um what does it mean and so yeah writing the writing the stuff going back in time was really quite intense and i felt in my body i honestly had like flood of whatever the chemicals are mm -hmm. where i really was reliving bits of it and um or it's or certainly the feeling of it you know the feeling of like sitting on the top of the stairs and knowing the stuff having you know that kind of thing you have when you're a kid we are looking at stuff through the, through the you know banister or whatever mm -hmm. we're hearing things before. It was very physical. So I guess what I had to support was that, you know, I'm lecturing and teaching creative writing. So I know the theory and I kind of, I'm a little bit older so I could step back. I'm at a kind of very stable place in my life. Like if I just tried to do it in my wilder twenties or whatever, <laughs> who knows, <laughs> that would have been chaos. Mm -hmm. um, so those kind of things. I did do a bit of therapy. I really didn't want it to seem like a great big therapy thing on the page. I had to figure out what to extract and mm -hmm. learning what to leave out and not what and try not to just dump everything in was a massive thing as well. Um, and yeah, so I, I felt relatively supported at moments. I thought it's too much, you know, it's just it's it's a very hallucinatory strange thing to do but also ultimately it was very um what i found really interesting was making bigger connections through generational stuff generational trauma um geographical locations um understanding things around my feeling around coming from crew and f reclaiming that and feeling at home in that Whereas before I was very conflicted about that. Um, why my Irish and Welsh family were there and what they, their relationship with kind of British um, colonial and industrial history is. And as soon as I could see these links and how they kind of filter in and impact on individual um, lives with my family as a kind of case study, I felt very, I felt, I felt kind of grounding, which kind of helped with the full onness of writing that autobiographical stuff. I, I mean, your your dad had a terrible experience when yeah. he was young with his father. Yeah. Um, is that is that a granddad that that you knew? I mean, what so a he, frightening figure. <laughs> yeah, he was a very tricky figure, and actually, no. I don't think I'll offend any family members by saying this because they, if they look watch it, because they all feel the same. But nobody, nobody, nobody liked it. Nobody liked him in our family. Mm -hmm. And actually, I really regret not talking to him because it's only after he died that I, I knew he had a very strong military history. And actually, we found all these certificates. So he's in the SES, and he did these um, flying from helicopters into the 
bought what was then called Borneo jungle and stuff. So my granddad was actually part of almost every single conflict from the 50s that the British did horrifically horrible things at. So he was in Cyprus, he was in Malay- Malaysia, he, he was, he was at, I think even the Suez Canal. You, know, you can trace through his military history this really um, profound kind of complex um, violence around um, decolonization. So as Britain and Englishness kind of fell apart in its holding on to empire, my grand was actually like a foot soldier in many of those battles. And I hadn't really fully comprehended that until recently. He was in Ireland. He was, he was really, you know, so and it's like, I find that really disturbing and then he would bring that violence back into the family unit. So when he came back from wherever he was, he was a very, very violent person. And, you know, his children would we themselves, a couple of them, one, at least one of them, and they all had really violent encounters with him. And um, the, they all had to uh, kind of... Um, basically all ran away or got away as quickly as they could when they were 15, 16, apart from the, the younger ones. So, you know, the, I don't, I haven't even begun to fully process what that means. You know, he was a person who was from a, uh, he himself was um, Irish heritage and and his um, mum was, so I think he grew up with, uh, there was some kind of adoption or severing at some point and a lot of violence in his childhood as well. And that kind of filtered down. And so you can see like that, you can see that incredible link, can't you, between him being flown in to some jungle somewhere and killing people and then coming home and then being horrible to everybody in the house, mm. you know, it's connected. Mm. Um, and and then that kind of feeding out into where they lived in crew and he and and, and and opportunities and stuff there so you I've, you can't really take away those individual experiences without seeing the bigger picture mm-hmm. and actually i really regret i didn't like nobody liked him he wasn't particularly nice even when he got he didn't turn into a bumbling nice person and uh he, I really, but I do regret not interviewing him actually and speaking to him more about it. Mm. But I sort of didn't figure it all out until just after he'd passed away. Mm. But the mm. trauma that he, you know, my my grandmother, who's who's the Welsh one, who's dead now, um, you know, the the domestic violence within the house, within houses in in i mean and i know it still goes on now but within that time that was almost almost acceptable it was so extreme to to kind of kind of feel read about and and listen to family members and and you know and i remember actually when i went to visit my grandmother uh when my son was about two and a half and <clears throat> They were quite old by then and, and my granddad and um, my son was doing that toddler thing of running around their house and my na- my nana well she absolutely loved like a really lovely person like pure kind of hugs and food and welshness and loveliness right and i, I went in with two-year-old and actually my baby in a sling and um, my son was being really naughty and doing something really naughty and she said well you would normally give him a whack or a hit but we can't not allowed to do that now are we and then she just said it so casually mm-hmm. and then just with this history behind it and i just remember thinking oh my god and then just like pulling the children away from that casual you know mm-hmm. sort of abuse mm-hmm. that would mm-hmm. have existed mm-hmm. at that time yeah yeah it's really extraordinary and and this backstory uh makes it all the more poignant that your father seemed to be such a gentle soul um, yeah yeah you know wanting to sit and meditate and who knows what kind of processing he had to to go through you yeah know, it's exactly and also has never you know hasn't been through therapy it hasn't done all those things because he's of a class and generation where that's just not a reality um Mm -hmm. 
and so has to figure things out in his own way yeah mm -hmm. but yeah mm -hmm. it was very it was very difficult for him i think and um, there's a really funny moment because you know you're you're you, you sort of show how you grow through this extraordinary experience and then you become a bolshe teen and quite um quite sort of premature bolshe in a way i think you probably had to be um yeah there's a fabulous moment when some, <laughs> somebody comes in <laughs> and they hold up a piece of fruit and say you know what is this <laughs> And then, and then, you know, this is how it's written. And this teenager goes, an apple. Yeah. <laughs> and then the little, the little addition is fucking hippies. <laughs> <laughs> and it is this great light moment. Um, and I wondered, uh, like, you know, like I say, a little, a little ray of light in a, yeah, a story yeah. that can be quite difficult. But I wanted to ask, did you, did you sort of, what did it give you that's positive yeah this whole thing because every there's always some kind of upside and yeah. i tend to call it a superpower yeah but no something, going through something so extreme will give you something and if yeah. so what what is that thing i think um so let's think what i think i have a kind of energy which is kind of you know filtered in some way so whenever i'm i don't know working with someone or doing something they will generally say and hopefully it's not too manic and hyper but it's a kind of force like i i think that you only have like a short amount of time and there's and it's good to do stuff and you can be creative and you can come up with ideas and you can share ideas and you can give stuff back i i think that what my weird completely weird childhood has given me is this kind of sense of um non-complacency i don't really know how else mm. to term it like a kind of um push to um be creative like and and messy and explore stuff and also like to be able to be a bit of a failure or a bit all over the place and that's okay and then kind of bring it back together again as well I kind of mm -hmm. um you know just do what you need to do draw something it doesn't have to be brilliant and then just put it out there anyway um so I think where whereas you might be kind of restricted by I don't know taste or ambition or something for me I've got this kind of compulsive thing which could be go in a horrible direction but i've managed to i think for now anyway let's see how life <laughs> let's see how life goes but push in a creative mm -hmm. way yeah does that make sense sort of it does yeah and I, some I, kind of energy yeah i wondered whether there was also a sense that you know because there was all this stuff pressing in on you that you just had to get through you had to like no i'm me i have my own thoughts and I wondered whether that's something that you take through in life that, you know, like other people don't impinge too much. It sounds yeah. like that's what you're saying in a, in a different way. Yeah, I you think you actually can drive through, you know. Yeah, I think so. And also, um, you know, being able to make a shape out of the massive blob of time and life and stuff that is mm. your own experience um is such a a privilege it's a privilege but it's, it's such a powerful thing to do and when i have a chance to share with it might be a student or a teacher at university or someone i'm talking to or whatever like just a little bit of how you might do it whatever it is whether it's like creating your own photo album and putting things in the right order or whether it's having a really cool sketchbook and making it really great or whether it is writing you know your whole existence as far as you can express it um it's so it's so powerful isn't it to just put your arrangement of time and space and thoughts in a particular order you know and um so yeah i kind of <laughs> hope that i can kind of get help and get people to do that as well so let's let's talk about 
the museum. Yeah. Um, so we have been talking about your book, the Museum of Lost and Fragile Things, and all these pictures on the rather nice cover. They are they they're quite meaningful. Um, you know, like the suitcase with a sticker on it and the a typewriter and a, a glass paperweight. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about the museum itself and how yeah. that came about. So I've had this weird feeling about provincial sort of oldie worldy museums for a long time. I really love them, you know, taxidermy and strange cases and <laughs> why is that next to that? And um, so these pictures are all on the front of this, on the front cover are all things that I ha have got here and um, managed to salvage in different ways. And this idea of, um, this idea of kind of, you know, writing about yourself is very exposing. It's exposing of yourself, but also of everyone around you. But at the same time, those of us who write feel compelled to put something out there where, you know, give an opinion or shape an experience or whatever. It seemed to me that putting, putting artifacts and bits of things about yourself and curating them in a way and then kind of inserting them into some institution that somehow even if it's a little provincial one rather than a big one is somehow putting my own story into a bigger picture it's kind of it's almost like stepping into the museum case or being allowed to be part of the things that are in this kind of sequence of history or culture or whatever mm -hmm. and i think I always, when I was a kid, felt like the gr the grand institutions, these great big museums or the great big art galleries are so unimaginable to infiltrate, you know, to get into whatever it may be. And like most sixth formers, I used to, or like teenagers, I would waft around at the Tate Britain, you know, like, <laughs> how, does, how do you become part of this universe, whether it's being a curator or being on the wall or whatever. And so it was a kind of idea of, taking a, a step from the outside and becoming inside the uh the kind of museum space oh okay yeah. <laughs> i mean it, it did really happen and you yeah. did yeah, actually yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's in a way that's the culmination point of the book um when that happened did you know you were going to write about it because it, it sort of builds to that point um but maybe I, it was before you even thought uh, about doing a memoir let me think with the sequence of i when i've in early drafts i didn't know that that was going to be the big point of it and i was doing mm -hmm. some writing workshops as part of a project with where the museums about um so i was working with older people and artifacts and memories and stuff like that so I knew that what what I found you know and I think this is in the book I found amazing about these these participants who were all women who were in their 80s or 90s um I mean maybe one that was really like 99 and the the way their relationship with staff was so interesting so I worked with um um one woman and she was telling me her story and if they couldn't write they were recording it and if they could write they, they were writing it it was a sort of creative writing workshop and what they all did was they kept trying to give me their things so I went in with one yes. woman and she was yeah it's was in there isn't it take yeah. take my take my really precious picture of my husband take my wedding you know and he's like no my god no stop you know and and the, the the workshop groups that i worked with in the um that were in their 80s were all dealing with their stuff you know i was in my flat mm -hmm. and i'm moving house and uh, by the time it got to the 90s they just wanted to give it away Everybody wanted to give it away <laughs> <laughs> and i just found mm. that so interesting so i was thinking about all of that while i was writing it then I was doing the actual museum stuff and then the idea of the museum of the self came out around that time but I think it was a later draft where I pulled it in as a kind mm. of point in mm. the yeah mm. I mean it also seems for your for your mother as though actually seeing the museum the the curated space she put together 
almost preempted any feelings that she might have about the memoir itself, because that seemed to be the big moment when she processed. Yeah. Um, when she... And it's awkward. It's very, very awkward. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. But maybe, it's... maybe a lot of stuff had sort of been worked through at that point. Yeah. With her. So my mom, you know, so I didn't know that the book was going to be uh, very much about me and her at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be more balanced. Um, but then as I was writing it, I realised that was part of mm -hmm. the big struggle. And in a way, I really don't know if she would see it this way, but I wrote it as a kind of love letter to her. <laughs> I don't know. But that's what I was hoping towards, like, I want to understand you, you know, I need to understand this relationship and how it relates to everything else. Um, you know, and she has her own struggles. We all have our own struggles. And so dealing with that. Um, so in the, in the book, when we get to the museum point and then, and then uh, me and my mom have a kind of altercation of an actual physical altercation and, um, I'm trying to confront her with um, a kind of reality, which is these behaviours that you do, even though I can understand they're all connected to these various different factors, have this impact on me and this is how it feels. And I'm trying to sh give that to her, to make her see and listen to that. And she has her own world and she has her own existence and she you know, so we, we had done versions of that altercation through time in different ways, you know, and um, it was the most kind of symbolic in a sense, but in the museum, but we've, we've had versions of it before mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. since actually. So, you know, when it comes to things like very very complex mental health conditions and very complex inherited trauma, that all of our family have actually in different ways that I didn't even know until working through this book you know it's it's there's there's never going to be a moment of solution of grand mm -hmm. solution and so we just mm -hmm. figure out what we do around it yeah mm -hmm. um but it was for it was it was in many ways a hot the book was a kind of letter to my mum so hopefully that comes through um, but also a kind of general story as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you are you um, now returning to fiction with a sigh oh God, yes. of relief? <laughs> <laughs> I am, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, is that something you're writing at the moment, the next? Um... Yeah. So as I was talking about earlier with my granddad and that link to that link to that kind of really complicated um uh colonial history and mm. british behavior so I, I i i'm exploring that link and i went to cyprus on a research trip to the university of cyprus and and looking at you know i find you know i i don't know if other people of my generation feel like this but i feel like everything i learned in history was was wrong and actually kind of dealing with um british behaviors around the world um and how i relate to it but not just in a like self-attacking or you know it's mm -hmm. just really complicated and i want to understand it but at the same time i want to tell a good story and not go really mm -hmm. really heavy 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 mm -hmm. so i'm exploring something around i'm really interested in kind of um women who women who weren't like the really glamorous beautiful ones or the um front um like and, and kind of more of the secretaries and the backroom ones and their roles and things and kind of a subversive history that was kind of fighting back against that so i'm exploring that sort of territory sounds terrific thank Go you yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah okay I, just, I was trying to say what it is without saying what it is but it's like... <laughs> I know. I mean, you can never go too deep into what you're actually writing because it's sort of, it, uh, yeah. it, you can't talk it out. That's you know, right. You, yeah. you have to sort of That's be a bit right. secretive about it. But that does sound 
fascinating oh, and, and books do come out of the previous book in a way don't they that's right yeah yeah there's always something a little bit unfulfilled or something that oh I want to go in this direction so yeah yeah, yeah. it sounds and, like a great yeah great the other choice. thing I, I find interesting is you, you know cassettes and recordings and histories of things and secret tapes that have been hidden and voices from the past and all of that yeah mm -hmm. so. mm. Amazing. Um, right. Well, I shall I shall wrap up with the three questions. Uh, always interesting to get authors views. Um, yeah. So the first one is favourite artwork. I'm kind of imagining it might not be a sort of Indian themed thing, but who no. knows? <laughs> tell us tell us <laughs> well actually it links to the museum thing so mm. it was all this is almost a raging cliche and i almost didn't do it for that reason and then i thought no i will because it, it was so i don't know if you know the artist um francesca woodman do you know oh, yeah. her? yeah amazing yeah. photographer yeah. amazing right yeah, yeah. Oh. so many young women uh of a certain age like usually between an, about i'd say 18 to 25 fall in love with her and go misty-eyed mm -hmm. over her and then project all their own stuff on her mm -hmm. and then write millions of diaries and essays about her which is exactly what I did so yeah she's a she's a she's a photographer a visual artist and I first saw um her work actually there was a an article in the observer written by Gabby Wood in about 99 and I saw the pictures and they blew my mind so I went immediately to the photographer's gallery which I think was when it was on just off Charing Cross still and so it's the Francesca Woodman's um, um, picture and it's um, called House and it's um, part of the series of her um, self-portrait of her kind of fading into a house mm -hmm. and you've got like this um, bit of her and then a fireplace and a dilapidated wall and what at, at that age I guess I was early 20s maybe 24 something like that all I knew was she had captured something psychological and experiential that I that I that worked for me and that was beyond words and that kind of resonated mm -hmm. and I didn't know why I couldn't understand why but it was mm -hmm. strong and I think since then there have been lots you know there have been so many different people have projected their stuff onto her and she had the thing that she killed herself very young so mm -hmm. you've got all the kind of mm -hmm. stuff that comes with that she jumped out of a hotel window when she was 22 so very tragically yeah. so um this idea of her kind of trying to escape the confines of the house of herself of what she was boxed into and of um the confines of art the square of the the camera all sorts of things anyway but, but I didn't have that verbally in my head I just had a strong reaction then I then I went off her and thought she was a bit too gothic wafting around with frocks and DMV and, I was like, yeah. and then I came back to her uh, not long ago when I was writing this book and just before and I realized that she was using visual medium to put out there certain kind of um Exp and uh, forms of expression that were really quite amazing and so it, I kind of viewed it again much later mm -hmm. and I could kind of figure out what it was that how it was it was a kind of I found it was a sort of way of telling a story it was narrative based mm -hmm. that um was really quite phenomenal so yeah I would say that's mine. Mm -hmm. I think um Don Patterson, the poet, wrote a collection that had a lot of poems about her work yeah. in it, which which was really interesting, you know, because yeah. you you can it's tempting to think, you know, it's not a guy thing. Yeah, no, it is. Oh, she's got a lot of fangirls, that's for sure. Yeah. But I, I think um, mm. her archives, her parents were very, con mm. her parents had a lot of control over her archive stuff, and they've mm. passed away, and so now there is a woman foundation trust and more of her materials are coming out what i find really interesting is her diaries and the crossover so she would write on her negatives her neck she would um send her negatives fo photo negatives as um film negatives as and she'd stick them on card and send them as invites so all the matter and material of her artistic mm -hmm. world would all cross over so there'd be like recipes mm -hmm. mixed with labels mixed with and that 
really appeals to me with you know female or actually not female any creative artist mm -hmm. um that crossover between domestic life and making stuff i find that very mm. interesting yeah. terrific very good choice francesca woodman um now the book of the book of shame uh which is a bit of a silly title we're not we're not really into shaming people but it's just a book that you've been meaning to read or you should yeah. have read or you feel a little bit oh strange yeah. or do well, you have a gap in your reading like that i do so i'm going to confess to proust and right. um, so I have read, so correction, when I was really, I had a fever at one point and I listened on an audio book to mm -hmm. Swan's Way and I absolutely loved it. It was, uh, the, the actor was Neville somebody and it was brilliant. I was absolutely bonkers off my head being, having a fever. Um, mm -hmm. I think I had a virus pre-COVID times and I was, so I listened to the whole book, but I don't remember any of it. And I, I know, all I know is I loved it. Um, and so really, I can't really say I've read it. <laughs> Just listen to it. <laughs> Fever state. Um, so I really, mm -hmm. and about three different times in my life, I've bought all of the books, seven books. And then I've since lost all seven books and various <laughs> movement around. Or whatever. And so I really do mean to one day work, work my way through. And you did true. say you find it difficult to hang on to things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. That's 21 versions of Proust that I've managed to lose. <laughs> um, I've only ever listened to an audio book as well, and I can't remember who, who read it, but it is a sort of dreamlike flow. It's you know, structurally, fun. it's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Because it is yeah. about memory. I mean, obviously, it's about yeah, memory. It's about so. memory and return mm. and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, um, yeah, of course, if you're really snobbish, I have heard people say, you know, well, I read it in French. I know. I and know. There's just nothing you can say to that. I really. know. It's, it's just, just a so shame. Much. You can't you be know. a memoirist and have not read Proust. So I just <laughs> put my head in shame. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, he had his Madeline that brought things uh, flooding back. I, I wondered whether, you know, in a negative sense, in a way, a whiff of incense will just have you running, oh, it running does. hysterically out it of does. the room. It, it, it does. And actually, uh, so I still do yoga. And of course, when my mom, when they were doing yoga, it was, it was, it was quite, it, there were still like church halls that wouldn't let you do it in case oh, you were wow. watching the devil, oh, weren't wow. there in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. And um, so funnily enough, my yoga teacher, uh, uh, had read the book and she said to me oh my god I'm really sorry for saying I'm really sorry for using some of the words are they triggering you are they triggering you <laughs> <laughs> I said oh, she's really honest they are because I don't really see why we, we all sit around saying namaste it feels a bit a bit mm. appropriate you know appropriate it's a bit embarrassing and I, I think it's a bit should be looked at actually but I just mm. quite like doing yoga so I sort of ignore it um <laughs> but yeah it's quite funny uh incense does really trigger me <laughs> <laughs> you know that one that students have, Nag Champa. Do you know that one? Really stinky, yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Pervades Chuli. everything. <laughs> Truly makes me twitchy. <laughs> um so yes, well bizarre feedback, funny feedback on your work. I mean, as I was reading the book, you were almost being given feedback as you went along by these weird I don't want to say weird, but, you know, people who came back into your life. So yeah. um, there's a bit yeah. of strange feedback in the book. But apart from that, um, what sort of bizarre oh, no. reactions have you had yeah. to anything? You know, this to book or bit. previous book? Well, with my first novel, it's called A Lady Cyclist Guide to Kashgar. And the Daily Mail, who, were, who, who actually it was a really good review, <laughs> but the headline they gave me was nuns on bikes <laughs> which 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 actually is a work of genius because <laughs> no one you get that thing with, so the ladies like guide to kashgar is about two british missionaries in the 20s women who went to kashgar and um um and actually lived a subversive life they were rather than mm -hmm. a christian but um nuns on bikes does that thing oh, at the time i was like oh my god but then i realize you know if you have that thing like that pitch you know can you describe your book in one word or three words or whatever mm -hmm. and I was like, actually it's quite a genius <laughs> way of summing up a whole book um mm -hmm. actually it was 
a nice review underneath. But yeah, that's kind of the funniest response to that. Well, um, yeah, a lot of people don't realise, and I've said this many times, that the writers don't write the headlines no. to no. their own pieces. Um, yeah. And it's surprising how often people don't know that. So writers get attacked in a way for a headline. I know. Um, I did. A, it doesn't I wrote, truly represent. Kind I wrote of what a piece. They said wrote anyway. Piece, yeah, I wrote a piece of travel writing, and it was pitched as kind of go to, you know, um, traveling on your own as a woman, um, but not a kind of you're getting divorced and finding yourself, but more mm. positive mm. things. So I wrote. I wrote a whole thing, and the headline was um, some was was about ditches children to travel so to travel alone. <laughs> or something like that. I was like, oh, mm, mm. brilliant, thanks. Mm. There's nothing even about the kids in there at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I used to write a lot of headlines. Ah, so you do Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if I got a good joke out of it... Um, if you could get a pun thing. or a really good... Like... I, was, I was all over puns. I used to get in trouble for my puns. Um <laughs> I think the, the one I really liked was um, quite a serious academic book about um, a, a, a species of publishing in in the medieval times, or no, Renaissance. Um, and Venice was a centre of publishing. It's a very complicated story. Yeah. Um, and they published self-help books. So they are sort of Renaissance self-help books. Yeah. Um, so I titled this, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venice. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I was, you know, I'm still pleased with that. Very that's, proud of yourself. Very that proud. still makes me um, laugh. And then another one that I didn't think was um, particularly brilliant, but the editor liked it. Uh, it was about food in the time of ancient Rome. <laughs> Um, and I called it O Tempera O Munchies. <laughs> Brilliant. That's Brilliant. the sort of thing I like to do, it's you so see. Fun. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You were probably behind the nuns on bikes then, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I'd worked at the Daily Mail, I would I'd be proud to possess <laughs> nuns on bikes. Actually, one of the best headlines I ever saw was in Metro. And unfortunately, this is visual, but it was a review of a very upmarket Russian restaurant. And the um, the headline was, I almost saw Zars. Awesome. But it was spelled T-S-A-R-S. -S. So Brilliant. visually, yeah. I mean, I... Yeah, with yeah. little stars flying. I know it's brilliant. Fabulous. So a good headline is a, you know, it's an a art. thing of, of wonder. It is an art. It is an art. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been fabulous talking to you about your book, Museum of Lost and Fragile Things. One more look at the cover published by Indigo Press. We've got an Indigo theme going. Um, so, yeah, we'll have to get back in touch with you when when the novel's out. It sounds Hi. like it's going to be quite a I mean, it's a tough thing to write about, it sounds. But, yeah, but it's going to be, um, I'm coming from, um, it's not going to be heavy, don't worry. It's coming right. from kind of subversive, like finding yeah. a way through sort of thing. Yeah. Good story. Good yes. story. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much for joining me in the book bag. Thank you, Susie. Thanks for all those questions. Thank you. It's been fun. Yeah. And thank you very much for watching. Join me next time. I shall wrestle up another fabulous author to interview. Um, uh, in the meantime, yes, one more look at the book. It's a really interesting read. We have only just skimmed the surface of what's in this book. There's some quite sort of horrifying uh, moments I found that we haven't even got into. So we haven't spoiled it for you. Do uh, read this book. It's a very interesting addition to the memoir genre. So catch you next time. Goodbye.